This guy right here is why you should watch Miss Kuroitsu for the Monster Development Department. Absolute Zero Chief of Staff Magistus. It's not just that he's an evil businessman with a seemingly heart of gold that makes him funny, it's that he might be the absolute best businessman in the history of anime. There are certainly other characters who pull their comedic weight from time to time, but none of them do so as consistently as he does. Miss Kuroitsu herself is fine as a main character, and if you're into fan service, you might find a few other reasons to watch this show, but Magistus is one of the main reasons I'm giving this show a wreck. So is Miss Kuroitsu a timeless classic? No. Can it still be an enjoyable watch? Yes but it's not for everybody. Is it for you? Let's check it out. Welcome Little Orphan Anime, everybody. Toka Kuroitsu is a talented monster designer with a passion for her work who's repeatedly frustrated by bureaucratic roadblocks. She works as an assistant to Professor Sadaki in the monster development department of Secret Society Agastia, a supposedly evil organization that wants to take over the world. Agastia is led by its supreme leader, Lady Akashic, an impossibly strong child whose immaturity sometimes puts the monster development department in a bind and Megistus, who is both an evil master of devious schemes and a talented manager who seems to genuinely care for his subordinates. The beginning shows what you can expect from a typical episode. The professor puts Kuroitsu in a jam by slapping together a monster proposal at the last minute and then has Kuroitsu deliver the proposal to the board of directors. It's pretty great that the first battle we see is a metaphorical one between Megistus and Kuroitsu for budget approval of a development project. We get the tense music, the sharp angles, and the special effects pyrotechnics of a blockbuster superhero showdown just in the context of a day-to-day -day business meeting. There's a Japanese word that perfectly explains what's going on in Miss Kuroitsu. And even if you've never heard the word before, you probably know what it means. That word is tokusatsu. And if you need a shorthand to remember it by, just think Power Rangers and Godzilla. Tokusatsu is a genre of Japanese entertainment that involves big monsters, giant robots, and of course, masked or helmeted heroes, usually wearing some form of colorful spandex. Japanese fans love tokusatsu, and Miss Kuroitsu both parodies and celebrates this distinctive brand of Japanese entertainment. In every credit sequence at the end, they include the local heroes who are featured in that episode. I had no idea what this meant at first since I'm not into tokusatsu. I'm still fuzzy on the details, but it looks like each of those local heroes are part of a group who put on performances for the town's kids, either theater style or maybe on local television. If you've seen Polar Bear's Cafe, it's like what the penguins do when they set up their Penguinger superhero show at the zoo. People show up at the designated time and watch the local heroes take down costume bad guys, kind of like if someone put on a Power Rangers play at the park. If you're more familiar with tokusatsu than I am, then let me know what I'm missing down in the comments. The episode titles are hilariously long. I don't know if that's spoofing tokusatsu or if it's riffing on long light novel and anime titles, but some of those titles are pretty funny. The legendary emissary from hell who constantly hears the screams of the evil souls supping from the kettle of darkness spreads fear in his wake as he awakens. That's episode two. The OP for the show is a great fit. The music is upbeat and it fits the tokusatsu genre. Plus you've got great action shots of everyone looking serious and determined as they're introduced with these angular split screen freeze frames. The main ED is also a good fit for the genre, though I think the OP fit just a bit better. The anime has a surprisingly large cast of characters for a 12 episode run a lot of the more important names have some connection to hidden knowledge, magic, or the occult. Megistus, for example, means great in Greek and probably refers to Hermes Trismegistus, an ancient philosopher and alchemist who was seen as an early sage of occult magic. This might mean that Agastia is based on the Order of the Golden Dawn, a real-life secret society dedicated to magic, alchemy, and the occult that was founded in part on the philosophies of Hermes Trismegistus. The name Agastya is the name of an ancient Hindu sage, and its leader, Lady Akashic, refers to the Akashic Records, which are supposedly a record of everything in the universe that is stored on another plane of existence, according to 19th century psychics and occultists. One of the more successful monsters was Canon Thunderbird, who's like a cross between a chicken and a robot. It's fun to watch Canon's design journey from original concept through the cuts and slices of the bureaucratic machine down to his final form. One of my favorite jokes that can be easily overlooked is at the end of Canon's development process. The whole team, including Canon, is celebrating the successful completion of a long project with the Japanese tradition of eating katsu, which is breaded and fried meat, usually chicken or pork. There's a play on words in Japanese between that type of fried food and the word for victory. So students, athletes, or even business people will celebrate with katsu after a big victory or before a big event. What this means is that you have maybe a six and a half foot tall chicken clinking drinks with his coworkers while there are boxes of fried chicken sitting there on the table. Episode two is also where we first see Karen Mizuki, a hapless temp worker who gets roped into the henchwoman business when she takes a job with the death staff temp agency. She does not take well to the work at first, but the money's too good to pass up. 
and she gradually forms a friendship with her supervisor. And then there's Wolf Bait, the most controversial character in the show, and probably the reason why some people are review bombing it. Wolf Bait literally means wolf beast in French, and is a reference to the Beast of Gévaudan from 18th century French folklore. He's a monster designed with a male brain who is switched to a female body at the whim of Lady Akashic. Kuroitsu generally treats him with respect, but Lady Akashic is pretty dismissive of his situation, and she tends to use female pronouns with him even after he asks her not to. Some of the uproar over misuse of pronouns for Wolfie stems from translation issues. Students taking Japanese are often told that Chan and Kun are female and male respectively, and while that's usually the case, it's not always true. So the use of he or she in the subtitles can sometimes create the appearance of discrimination which is not present in the original. But there's no getting around the fact that characters do disrespect Wolfie's situation, and the show often plays his body swapping for laughs. If you view this gender-swapped monster in a comedy anime as a commentary on trans rights, you're probably not going to like this show. A couple of things have held this show back from being more popular. We already talked about the negative reaction to Wolfie, but there's also the show's production schedule. A couple of episodes were delayed by a week due to production difficulties, and a mid-tier show like this could not afford to just skip a week or two from the anime scene. It's pretty ironic that episode 6 was scheduled to release during the week of Valentine's Day, but it got pushed back due to production delays, because the exact same thing happens in the episode. Kuroitsu has an idea for a Valentine's monster, but the team is unable to meet their production deadline and have to release the monster after Valentine's Day. The show makes a point of saying how any Valentine-themed product loses almost all of its value as soon as Valentine's Day is over. This makes the delayed Valentine's episode even funnier, and it makes me wonder if that delay was deliberately planned from the beginning. The production values can be inconsistent as well. Episode 9 in particular has a rushed feel, with some pretty basic background designs, and multiple times where you can see the resolution drop as they zoom out from an extreme close-up. Episode 11 has some issues not just with the visuals, but with the sound as well. There are some jarring sound effects that accompany the OP in that episode for some reason. The effects are so out of balance with the volume level of the rest of the show that I had to wonder if maybe someone with less experience was forced into handling the sound mixing due to a rushed schedule or because somebody got sick or something. But I loved how the show ended. I won't spoil it, but I really enjoyed it. I think hardcore tokusatsu fans would really love it. I was surprised when I started doing the research for this video that Miss Kuroitsu has flown under the radar so much. The show will probably never have a huge following, and it does have a lot of flaws, but when it was good, it made me laugh out loud multiple times per episode, and that counts for a lot. Do yourself a favor and skip most of episode 11. Just watch the post credit scene, and then jump into the excellent final episode. I give Miss Kuroitsu from the Monster Development Department a 7 out of 10 Megistasises, Megis, Megis die. 7 out of 10 albuckies, and tokusatsu fans could probably add a point. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.